Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Dick Broderson, and today I'm here with our new co-host, William Green. William, how are you today? I am great, Stig. It's lovely to be here with you. So, William, many of our listeners already know you. Uh, we had the privilege of having you on our show quite a few times. Back in 2015, uh, that was the first time we talked about your wonderful book, The Great Minds of Investing. And here recently, we talked about Richer, Wiser, Happier. And, and I've said it before, I will happily say it again. It's the best investment book I've read in 2021. So, uh, William, it's just, it's just an honor to welcome you as our new host here on the We Study Billionaires feed. Uh, thanks so much. I, I've been a great admirer of the Investors Podcast ever since I first came on the show as a guest about seven years ago, I think, and and saw just what a superb job you and Preston do of conducting these really really thoughtful, in depth interviews. So I'm I'm thrilled to be joining you as a co host. It's a it's an exciting new adventure for me. And 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 it's an exciting new adventure for for us, William, uh, because aside from today's episode with Red Dalio, Starting in March, uh, I'm happy to announce that you will once a quarter host a six-episode miniseries here in the We Study Billionaires feed. And the miniseries uh, which you will host will be branded as Richer, Wiser, Happier. Uh, William, who have you invited to your show for the first miniseries? I've got some wonderful investors lined up for my first interviews, uh, including Howard Marks, Joe Greenblatt, Bill Miller, Monish Pabrai, all of whom are key figures in Richer, Wiser, Happier. And usually I would interview great investors like these in private, and then I'd write about it and you'd get to read the results of the interview years later. So this time, for the first time ever in my career, uh, our, our audience is going to get to listen in on the the conversation itself. So I, I really hope they enjoy it. I, I'm sure they will. And, and what a what a lineup. I mean, <laughs> it's uh, it, it doesn't get any any better than that. Um, you know. Speaking of things, almost can't get no better. Uh, we are here today to talk about Redalio's new book, uh, "Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order," and it's a you, you you made it was a marvelous interview, and it's it's a fantastic book. And I just wanted to to preface um, the the interview by saying that Redalio has had such a profound impact on everything we do here in the company. Uh, everyone. On TIP, they they read his his book Principles. Uh, now we're reading uh, his newest book. And after Warren Buffett and and Charlie Munger, I would say that Redalio has had yeah the most profound impact on how we think about business, how we think about um, the macroeconomic uh, environment. So it's it's absolutely wonderful um, to to be able to welcome uh, Ray on the show. Uh, before we jump to your interview with Redalio, William, uh, is there anything that the listeners should know? Sure. Ray, Ray Dalio is one of the great legends of the investment world. He runs Bridgewater Associates, which is the biggest hedge fund in the world. And Dalio's personal fortune is about $20 billion, according to Forbes. So he's one of the most successful investors of all time. But he's also an extraordinary thinker who's written books like Principles, which was a number one bestseller. And now, as you mentioned, this fascinating new book, uh, The Changing World Order. And I think you'll see in the in the podcast interview and also in this new book, he's warning us pretty uh, frighteningly in some ways that we need to prepare as investors for a period that could be extremely challenging. So there's a real urgency to his message. But the thing I think I like most about this interview is is that Ray is also incredibly candid about some of the personal challenges he's been going through. And he talks at length also about other really important issues like how we can learn to think better, how to be more resilient, uh, and and also about how to invest better in a period that's uh, that's likely to be fairly tumultuous and not not likely to be as um, as smooth sailing if you're in America as as we're used to. So I I hope you enjoy this very wide ranging interview with with Ray, who really is one of the undisputed giants of investing. All right, William. It sounds like we're in for. For quite an episode here. So without further delay, here is William Green's interview with Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio, it's wonderful to have you here. Many thanks for speaking with us today. And congratulations on your new book, The Changing World Order, which I have here and which I've spent the, the last week reading through with much fascination. It's an extraordinary book. It's um it's hugely ambitious and I have to say pretty scary. Um it's uh it's based on your study of the rise and fall 
of about, I'd say, 11 leading empires over the last 500 years. So you're taking this, as you put it, a, a mega macro perspective to see what history can tell us about the future. I wondered if you could start by telling us why you undertook this gargantuan study. Yeah, I'd, <clears throat> I didn't really um, intend the study. I, uh, there were three things that have happened in my life that are happening now that are transformative and that are different than happened any time in my lifetime before. And so I thought that I needed to study what went on prior to my lifetime in order to understand those. Um, those three things are um, the creation of a lot of debt, which is monetized. In other words, the central bank prints a lot of money and buys that debt. Uh, that happened, has not happened in the degree that uh, we are seeing uh, since the 1930 to 45 period. Uh, second, um, internal conflict. Um, the size of the wealth gaps, the size of the political uh, polarity um, that relates to the wealth gap, the size of the um, left and the right and the extremity of the left and the right uh, is something that never happened in my lifetime before, but all those things happened um, before. And um, also uh, the rise of a great power uh, to challenge the existing leading power and the existing world order, uh, the rise of China, in other words. We began our world order in 1945 at the end of World War II, um, and that is the challenge. And those three things individually never happened uh, before in my lifetime, um, and let alone collectively. So that pattern uh, led me to want to understand the lessons from history. My, and, and I'll explain really how I came by that perspective. Um, I learned um, that many of the things that surprised me in my lifetime uh, just never happened to me before in my lifetime, but they had um, happened many times before. The first time that happened was uh, when I was clerking on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange in 1971. Um, and at that time, the um, gold uh, was um, the world's currency. The dollar uh, was tied to gold. Um, and so it was like checks in a checkbook. Uh, paper money had no intrinsic value and gold is what mattered. And we were um, losing gold. And uh, on August 15th, 1971, President Nixon got on the television and um, announced um, that you couldn't get the money as we, the gold, uh, to countries. And that was a shocking event um, to me. And I was very interested in markets. So I went down to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and I uh, expected pandemonium, and it was pandemonium, but it was on the upside, not the downside. And I didn't know why that was, why did the stock market rally so much? And then I studied history and found out that the exact same thing happened um, on March 5th, 1933, when Roosevelt got on the radio and told the public essentially, that they were um, not delivering the gold so that they could print more money. It's just that the, that was the first devaluation that ever happened to me, and I needed to go back in history. And so um, what I learned uh, was that I needed to study all important things in history, um, like I needed to study the Great Depression. And because I studied the Great Depression, um, I and my company Bridgewater were able to anticipate the 2008 financial crisis, which we couldn't have done without that study. And so when these three things started to come along and I didn't see them, I needed to go back and see many cases. It's like a doctor seeing many cases. When you see more and more cases of a disease, um, you understand it better. And so I wanted to study the rise and decline of reserve currencies. And since these cycles um, are quite long, um, like the Dutch had the, uh, the reserve currency and then the British had the reserve currency and the Americans and so on, I needed to go back um, about 500 years. 
So I studied them, and then I studied the rise and decline of dynasties, starting with the Tang Dynasty a little after 600, to see that what causes those rises and declines to understand what's happening now. And, and what did you conclude in terms of the major forces that actually drive the, the success or decline of an empire? Because it, it struck me, I, I've, I've long thought that one of the keys to your success has been this extraordinary ability that you have to systematize things, that you, you, you don't just look at the future and say, uh, well, China is rising and the US is in decline. You systematize it and you, you, you've, I, I think, separated into something like 18 different forces, but there are, there are three that you've referenced that I'd like to talk in more depth. But if you could give us a sense of, of this range of things that you studied, that it, in a sense in the past, I think, without the kind of computing power and without the enormous staff that you have at Bridgewater, I, I, I sense that that wouldn't actually have been possible to do the kind of enormous study that you've done. That's correct. Um, wouldn't have been possible. Um, also, I wouldn't have shared it before. Hmm. I'm now 72 years old, and I think it's very important, so I'm passing it along. But um, that's exactly right. As, as you saw in the book, um, there are measures of each one of those. So they're objective. Um, and by seeing numerically changes in each one of those indices, so you can compare the quality across countries and you can see it evolve. Um, one can see these transpire in a very clear way. Um, and also one can see the cause effect relationships. Um, you, you know, certain things happen. And yes, there's um, a typical cycle that I could describe if you'd like me to, um, but um, th those measures and that objectivity is, uh, is 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 very important and can be used um, because it creates first of all a template. It's like uh, if you have a disease. Um, use an example: if you have a deterioration and you have a cancer, is it at stage one, two, three, or four? Um, what are the measures? Uh, what is the next step? How does that progress? What are the treatments? Those kinds of things um, are the same in terms of looking at these issues. You, you make some slightly chilling predictions about the US um, without, without being definitive, because obviously these are, these are probabilistic bets. For example, I think at one point you say, I think that the odds of the US devolving into a civil war type dynamic within the next 10 years are around 30%. You say that's, that's related to the, the high risk of internal conflict, the, the kind of political polarization. Uh, an anger that we're seeing in the country. You also talk about the 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 rival with rivalry with China and say that the probability of a big war in the next ten years is thirty five percent. And I was I, I was both struck by the way that you think, the importance of thinking probabilistically, which is something that's always struck me when I interview great investors, whether it's Joel Greenblatt or Howard Marks. This this sense that nothing is black and white. It's always uh, betting on probabilities, which which clearly is something that you've been a, a master of over the decades. But also, I was very struck by actually the seriousness of of those claims. And I, I, I wondered if in if you could talk about that gravity, because you 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 say, for example, that that the the US really is in danger of of tipping over one way or the other. It, you say it's the world's leading power. Uh, the world's leading power is on the brink and could tip one way or the other. Can you give us a sense, digging into, um, first say, the, 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 the debt issue uh, and the printing of money, why this is such a precarious position to be in? Because I'm, I'm no economist and I, I sort of need the, the idiot's guide to why, uh, why this is such a treacherous financial situation to be in. Um, maybe I can describe uh, the typical cycle and then pull it out. And I won't go through all of the 18 measures, uh, but I, um, if, if that's okay, I think it'll create the uh, template. That'll be very um, helpful, thank you. <clears throat> um, there, are, there are internal orders and there are external orders. And what I mean is a, uh, by an order is a system of operating. Um, usually internal orders are, written by um, constitutions, um, you know, and um, external orders are written by 
um, treaties and so on. Um, so, um, uh, um, and they follow a war typically. Uh, so let's say World War II, there's a war. After the war, there are winners and losers. And the winners get together and they uh, determine the order, the system. Um, for example, the system in 1944, they determined the Bretton Woods monetary system uh, with the dollar at the center and gold at the center. And, they, and it was an American world order because the United States had 80% of the world's gold. It accounted for half the world's economy and uh, it had the um, monopoly on nuclear weapons, which was dominant in all. So the United States was dominant in all ways. And the um, center of it, the reason the United Nations is in New York and the IMF and the World Bank are in Washington because we began the American world order dominated that way. That's an example. But if you go back to other cases, um, the uh, Treaty of Versailles, was the prior world order. In other words, a war and then a resolution of that war and then new rules as to who did what. And if you keep going back, you will see that there are those world orders that just go back uh, the Peace of Westphalia in something like 1668 or something. Um, and each system then creates a new system and a new world order. Um, and, and okay. Now, um, and then that happens also internal orders like, uh, let's say a revolution. So um, um, the uh, Chinese world order, uh, domestic order began in 1949. They had a civil war and then they start their um, domestic order in 1949. And there's a cycle. And the way the cycle works typically is after the war, uh, there's a peace. Um, the peace comes uh, because there's a dominant power that no one wants to fight. And also everybody's so sick of war. And then so you, you usually have a period of peace, quite and often quite an extended period of peace. And there's the uh, consolidation of power by the new leader. And then the development of a system that allows development because you've wiped out a lot of the old. You wiped out the old debts, you wiped out many of the old things, but you're in the process of wiping them out at a new start. And then that begins um, the arc of the period of peace and prosperity and pro productivity. So for example, in the 18, the, the second industrial revolution was that kind of period. Uh, the post-war war II period was that kind of a period in which um, there's competition, things working hard, and there's a rise in living standards. And those rise in living standards uh, particularly work well in a capitalist economy. Um, and um, uh, capitalism was really, by that I mean markets, stock market and so on, was invented by the Dutch. And it's a way of creating buying power to enable, let's say, entrepreneurs to be able to do well. But it um, distributes wealth uh, differently. Um, so that it creates a larger wealth gap. Um, and over a period of time, it creates a larger uh, opportunity gap because there's a tendency of the, those who uh, gain wealth to um, be in a favored position. For example, their children can get education that poor children can't get, or they might have more influence and so on. And, and so you get larger gaps and you get, uh, and those gaps also can represent opportunity gaps and so on. And the same, there's a tendency also for debt and capital markets valuations to keep rising. So you, you debt rises in relation to income because debt is buying power. But there's like, if you pay it back in hard dollars or hard, whatever the currency is, um, then that's uh, a problem. So you see it rise, all of these cycles, you see debt rise relative uh, to income. Um, and, and that's because uh, it's better to have spending power. You, you know, like we had this last cycle, um, send out the checks and send out the money and you're sending out buying power. 
And that is so much easier to do and favorable to do than to uh, restrict it and to contain it. And so that's what raises debt relative to income and raises that so that you produce um, um, a debt cycle, you know, and it goes back to Old Testament and they'll talk about the 50 year cycle and the year of Jubilee and so on. But these cycles have gone on for a long time. And, and, and um, so these wealth gaps grow, the, um, the at levels of indebtedness grow. And also uh, what happens is the competitiveness as they get richer, uh, the competitiveness declines because it declines first because um, people, um, as they get richer, they become more expensive in the world. They wanna work less hard. Um, and also they uh, gather more uh, competition. So uh, let's say for example, um, the Dutch um, built ships that were the best to go around the world and collect riches. Um, but the British um, learned from that and hired Dutch shipbuilders to build ships more inexpensively and better ships by uh, learning from them. Um, and so others become more competitive. Um, also, when they uh, do very well at the top, um, uh, they uh, typically uh, become dominant in world trade. The Dutch uh, counted for 25% of world trade. And um, as a result, they bring their currency. And the currency uh, that's then commonly used around the world becomes a world currency, and which we call a reserve currency. And when they have that currency, um, then that becomes also something that people want to save in. So those in other countries um, will um, want to buy that currency, which means lend. And so that they will lend to countries, which tends to make them get more into debt. It's a, it's a great privilege. They call it the exorbitant privilege to be able to um, uh, borrow money from because you have the reserve currency but it does get you deeper into debt in your own currency. Um, and that sows the seeds again for problems. There's the political system that also operates uh, with this kind of cycle, which is the political system rewards um, spending because, um, and it doesn't penalize debt. Nobody pays attention to how much debt you get into. They pay attention to what they receive. And when they get more um, stimulation, uh, that, that, that produces it. So there's a tendency to have that, which raises the living standards over the short run, but also produces the, indebt the indebtedness for the long run. So that when you get, um, um, let's say, in the top of that cycle, you could see living standards are really at their highest. They're very high but they, you start to see the complexion of the finances deteriorate. You see the competitiveness deteriorate and so on. People, pay, people also um, behave differently. There's a, an age uh, cycle. You know, those who went through the war and went through the depression uh, have a different psychology than those who are now the next generation. So as this passes on, so they have the newer generation operating that, uh, they know really to enjoy life more, uh, devote attention to other things and so on. And so competitiveness starts to decrease while the indebtedness, but it's a very good feeling position to be in at that point, but that sows the seeds. Then when you have excessive levels of uh, indebtedness, um, I'm sorry for going on, but I'm almost- oh, it's, it's helpful, almost, thank you. Almost done. Um, when you have the, um, the gaps and the excessive level of indebtedness, and you have the bad finances, um, because when you have that borrowing in the debt, then um, it's bad for the owners of the debt. Like now, you have very negative real interest rates, in other words, inflation adjusted interest rates. So it doesn't make any sense to hold the debt, that, that, those assets. Um, and uh, then you see the movement to other things and so on. And then when you have the large wealth gaps, um, that enters into it um, at the same time as you have conflict, internal conflict and external conflict. 
when that gets there, uh, the cycles described in, in detail in the book, but you start to see political polarity and the rise of populism of the left and populism of the right becomes extreme and progressively more extreme. And as a result, um, the middle, you, you no longer can be in the middle. In other words, they, they say, pick a side and fight. And the media and the politics work together to, to um, enrage people and to make them uh, more inclined to fight. And of course, that generation didn't go through war because they didn't go through war. They're more inclined to fight. And everybody is cheering the fighter who will fight for their side. There's a uh, in history, it shows that when the causes that people are behind are more important to them than the system, the system is in jeopardy, and which is the case now. And so um, and, and so that progresses and you have either an internal conflict, you have a financial problem, you bet. Now, other things matter. You asked about the cycle because there are other things like education and civility. A long leading economic uh, indicator um, is um, the quality of education. And, uh, but education is not just um, uh, understanding uh, history or memorizing or knowing how to do math and such, and, and such things. It's also uh, education in civility, how people behave with each other, the idea of all of those. The better that, the mo as there's better education, um, there's better productivity that follows. So there are a number of measures that I include in there. For example, infrastructure investing, um, how much are, how you have been improving your infrastructure. There's measures of the military strength. You know, when they go internationally, they need a stronger military to protect their supply lines and all of that. All of those. So there's 18 different measures that you can see and you can see what the numbers were and are of those types of things to make up the arc. But the arc is basically along those lines until you get to the irreconcilable differences and you, whether they're internal or external and, that, and you get to uh, the financial problems. So that's why I'm saying, I think that's just by the measures, that's where we are. If we take the financial, very simple financial, is the amount of money that uh, somebody's earning greater than the amount that they're spending? And do they, are their assets uh, better than their liabilities? And that's true for individuals, companies, and countries, because that country's an aggregate of those. So you can look at the financial condition. When you get to the printing of money stage, you are late in the cycle, very late in the cycle. And that's, that's a concerning thing. So you have that financial piece together with the internal conflict or, you know, let's say internal order or disorder piece. There's a chapter on internal order and disorder and explains the cycle. And then there's the external order and disorder, but it's made up of a number of those other things like education, quality of leadership and so on. Yeah, I, I was very struck by some of the statistics that you gave for how strong the U.S. still is. Obviously, we're not saying that the, the U.S., it, it, we're saying it, it's, it's in decline, but it's still number one. And so you point out, for example, that I think you said that 50, 55 percent of the world's total market cap um, is in uh, U.S. equity equity markets. You said that 26 percent of global research and development spending is in the U.S., uh, I think something like twenty percent of the world's bachelor bachelor's degrees are in the U.S. So, so you're not saying the U.S. is vulnerable on every front. In a, in a, it seems like there are still some extraordinary strengths that the economy has, but it's becoming harder and harder to turn around this enormous shift. Is that is that a fair? Yes, that's right. I have uh, many many measures, and when one looks at them, they they paint a very rich picture. Uh, not only of the United States, but of all those other countries that I show there. I think I showed 12 or so, 11 or 12. Um, so you can see the picture, uh, and, and that's right. And um, if something as simple as education, if you were to take, um, um, you know, um, public education, um, and you use measures like PISA scores, the United States is very poor in the industrialized world, and it used to be uh, very good. It's, it's something like 38th in the world or something. But if you were to take um, universities, 
that are in the top 100 universities. So the um, education uh, is, is a very skewed education. And you look at the stats and you see a picture. If you go to a great American university, there are very few places that compete with that. And there are more of those great American universities. But if you look at the average level of education, it's, it's deteriorated and it's not very good. But the, uh, the main thing I'm trying to point out is that if you take those pictures, it paints a very clear and objective picture of what each country is like. There, there are a couple of things that I don't really understand that um, maybe you could put in in context, one of which I, I, I was talking to a well known um, mutual fund manager the other day who runs an international fund. And he he had just read your book and was saying, Yeah, this is this is all great. And I, I agree with pretty much everything. But why why is the US dollar so strong in relative terms compared to the last 20 years, despite the fact that we have all of these things you're mentioning, like huge trade deficits, faster money supply growth than our our peers, negative real interest rates, huge fiscal de deficits relative to GP, GDP, plus increasing political turmoil. What's what's going on there that the, the, the dollar hasn't rolled over and collapsed? Well, uh, uh, I'm going to, the dollar um, should always be looked at, the value of the money should always be looked at in relationship um, to good services, financial assets, and other currencies. And so what we're doing is referring to also other currencies in, in describing that. Um, so um, and um, uh, so what's uh, the major reserve currencies, the major other reserve currencies are, are um, the euro and the Japanese yen. Um, and then uh, there's the emergence of, uh, but still small, is the uh, China's yuan or RMB. Um, so um, the circumstances in um, the Euro and Japan are quite like those in the United States because of the same element of the cycle. In other words, it's like looking at the G7. The G7 are the old countries, the anachronism of, you know, in other words, you think, well, what is the G7? Um, and you look, run down the list of the countries and it's almost laughable that they would be the great powers. Um, and so they are also the reserve currencies, they're older. And so Europe has its issues and is pursuing policies that are the same. Japan is in, has its issues and, and are doing that. The renminbi has appreciated against the dollar, but it is not yet an effective alternative currency because it, it has not um, developed the, um, the evolution of being commonly used. By the way, that was intentionally because the Chinese did not want to threaten the dollar as a reserve currency. But it is internationalizing. And because it has relative appeal, um, its interest rates are, are, be are better. It's, um, and it's also its balance of payments is better. Um, it, it, it is appreciating. The depreciation of the dollar um, has, uh, should be measured against good services and financial assets because um, the loss of buying power. Everybody should judge um, their wealth, not in nominal terms. Don't say how many dollars I have, uh, but judge it in real terms because, and, and also judge it in, you know, through the lens of those other things. So um, you've seen uh, you know, the classic mechanical depreciation of the dollar. You've also seen it though in other, in other currencies too, because Europe had to pursue the same type of policy. Japan had to pursue the same type of policy of creating a lot of money in debt and monetizing it. So that reaction in the markets has been uh, the same throughout those countries. So, so in a sense, I, I, I was quite upset to read that part of the book that was suggesting that that a, a lot of our wealth seems to be illusory at the moment. That if 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 we invest in the stock market, for example, we we feel much richer than we probably are in real terms. And it seemed to me that that was one of the things that you were waking up readers to understand, to say, look, you, you may feel rich and you may be inclined to take late cycle risks and overspend and get too much in debt and speculate too much. And be careful because this, is, this, is, this wealth, in a sense, may be a little illusory. And the next 
the, the next period may be very dissimilar to the current period. Is, is that a fair characterization? Yes, and I'll add uh, cash to that. Investors make the mistake of judging their, um, their wealth in the number of dollars or pounds or whatever currency they're looking at it. And, and they should judge it in relationship to buying power. When a government produces a lot of money and credit and they've handed out all of these checks and you use the measure of wealth at, as having risen a lot, everybody um, appears to have been richer. You cannot get richer by producing more money and credit. Okay, you can only get richer by producing more goods and services. And so what happens is by judging it that way, they make serious mistakes, particularly on judging the riskiness of cash. So for example, you know, um, this year, um, investors, let's say, uh, who are holding cash, probably lost about 5% to inflation. And they'll continue to lose inflation. And if you look at what's priced in the markets, they're negative real returns. In other words, the bond markets are negative real returns. So if you buy a bond, you're locking in a negative real return. And cash is worse than that. So I want to highlight, please do not look at your returns and think that that's safe when that's not safe. It's better to build a far better diversified portfolio. Uh, and, and yes, so um, and, and uh, this is also we're at the part of the cycle where um, you know everybody got the check as the check, and they um, have the, the accounts, and they feel rich, and also interest rates are low, so that they could borrow money, and, um, and, and so the monthly payments are not much, and even you can get interest-only loans. So that means you you have no interest to practically to pay because they're so low, and you have no principal to pay for a while, and so you could just go get money. And, and that's why money is free. You can go get money and you can spend and you feel very, very rich. The other side of that is that now you are seeing um, that the inflation is picking up because everybody buys more. And so you have to look at what is the total quantity of money and credit created relative to the total change in the amounts of goods and services created. If you're not creating much more goods and services, or you're not creating much more even financial assets, but you are creating much more spending for them, you're going to raise their prices. And then that becomes the, the illusion, as you're calling it, because people say, I'm richer, but then they go to the gas station, and then they go to the uh, supermarket, and they go to on vacation, and they do all of those things, and they say, wait a second, I'm losing it. I feel like there's a bit of a conundrum here, and we'll 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 come back in greater detail to how to invest in this kind of environment later. But but while you mention this issue of debt and cash, I I I I just wanted to ask how a regular person like me or like the listeners to to this podcast should deal with the fact that the bonds seem to offer no protection, no return. Cash um, it seems seems to be we seem to be punished for saving cash. So at a time of of recklessness, where a lot of people are throwing caution to the wind and seem to be unaware of the kind of risks that you're describing, the usual conservatism that contrarian, value-oriented, prudent types might be inclined to, to resort to, that, that kind of behavior of saving money, sticking more money in cash instead of making aggressive bets, maybe making sure as someone like Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard told me many years ago, he would always say, well, make sure you own a balanced fund, make sure you always, you always have some bonds. So these classic ways of protecting ourselves suddenly actually don't seem to apply. And I'm struggling, I'm struggling to figure out how to respond to that. Well, there's the broadest sense. And then there's the bond question. Um, the broadest sense is um, um, be out of cash, be um, and um, have uh, little or no participation in interest rates, particularly if they're close to zero interest rates, because if they go, if the economy goes down, they will offer very little protection to your portfolio because they won't go up much because they're close to in zero interest rates. So uh, on the um, but so 
you can get a diversified portfolio of assets. And that diversified portfolio of assets can include things like in inflation index bonds and stocks and some element of gold and some other assets in different location. Because if you know how to diversify well, you'll find that um, asset classes, um, um, it's not so much that wealth is destroyed as much as it shifts where it is. So um, by being able to uh, see how it shifts and it moves around, and looking at the correlations of those and achieving balance, um, you can achieve uh, that kind of balance. I created what I call my all weather fund when I, when I first um, earned enough money that I knew that I would pass some along and I wouldn't be here. And I believed that active management would be a problem because uh, active management is a zero sum game. You gotta pick the winners and the losers and most people are not able to do it themselves and, and, and those who are winners um, get filled up pretty quickly. And, and so it's not easy to operate that way. So I created this all weather portfolio, which is a balance. It, uh, but balance is the key. Diversification um, uh, of achieving that um, uh, um, is is the is the is is the is the best path with staying out of the way of of cash and looking at one's returns. The most common mistake of investors is to think that the markets um, that went up are good investments uh, rather than more expensive. Um, and so what you see from um, it, so stay stay out of cash, achieve the balance, and then uh, don't make that mistake. Um, I remember uh, when um, the Magellan Fund was the best performing stock mutual funds, when stocks were the best asset class and, the, uh, and a very popular music uh, investment fund, but the average investor in it lost money. And the way the average investor lost money is because every time it was up a lot, they bought it. And every time it was down, they sold it. And so their bad market timing, because they were reactive, thinking it's a great investment when it's up a lot and when it's down a lot. And, and you know, and also you see um, ads that, you know, companies will put out ads, well, our last five or years return or this and that, or this is what the year is to attract people in. And those are the common mistakes of investors. So don't try to time it yourself because um, you'll probably lose. Uh, competing in the markets is more difficult than competing in the Olympics. There are more people trying to do it and putting more resources behind it. I know what we put in hundreds of millions of dollars a year and so on to try to do that. And it's competitive for us. It's competitive for others. And so um, um, to not try to do that yourself, but to achieve balance like I described them, you know, this all weather uh, portfolio type of approach. Um, but anyway, what I mean is balance and not time. And then you rebalance. So if something goes up a lot um, and then something goes down a lot, you rebalance to that diversified and that'll make you sell more as things get expensive and buy more as they go down and, um, you know, be humble. There's obviously been a, a great deal of euphoria about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And in some ways, it makes sense, given what you're saying about the devaluation of, of the dollar and other currencies. And in some ways, it makes me feel a little bit like I felt when I first was a financial reporter back in 1999, 2000, that there was this kind of wild speculative excess. And 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 there's something almost religious about about the the zealotry surrounding cryptocurrencies and so i i i i sense from your writing both in the book and the statements that you've made um on linkedin and elsewhere that that you're trying you're trying to be somewhat nuanced and polite about this but you you're i'm not try, I'm ever trying to be polite ah but but, <laughs> but you're not i mean you've said that you've said that you have a small somewhat negligible stake you've said that Gold, you still regard as a safe store storehold of wealth and a, a timeless and universal alternative cu currency. At a time when so many other people are saying that actually Bitcoin has become digital gold and and gold is useless, could you could you put a little nuance on on that and just also give us a sense of of whether the speculators on on cryptocurrencies are kind of lambs to the slaughter or whether it's a sensible hedge in a world where currencies are being devalued. 
Um, just to be clear, I'm trying to, I'll answer your question, but um, I'm not trying to uh, be politically correct or misstep or, or do anything like that. That's not, I, very few people have accused me of being that yeah, way. Uh, I, um, I'm, uh, I'm uh, straightforward, but um, issues are not as black and white as people want to do, do it. They want me to be either a raging bull or a bear and, you know, uh, that kind of thing and the circumstances. So here's what I think about them. Um, I think it's, uh, um, it's very impressive that this concept was programmed something like 10, 11 years ago and has uh, um, stood the test of time, meaning it hasn't been hacked. It hasn't, um, um, uh, the, the competition has been relatively modest. In other words, some of the risks in the earlier period are, you know, would this thing break down, ha be hacked? Would, um, would competitors to Bitcoin come along? And how do I know the next one? Because everything in the world gets old. And so it, you know, and there's a better competitive alternative. That's just the nature of evolution. And so those kinds of things, and then the ad um, um, adoption of it, um, in other words, uh, and, and it has pros and cons. Um, and, and at the same time, as you're right, um, it's, um, it, it has a bit of a zealot type of uh, following um, to some extent. And then there are, very, there are thoughtful people who also follow it. And, um, uh, um, but one wonders, in other words, when does somebody collect, take the money they made in Bitcoin and then diversify that and, and um, in other words, move to other things. And there are other things that are developing, not only other coins, but NFTs and other things that become popular with that crowd. And does that diversify that? And then there are regulatory issues that have to do with this because um, when you have an alternative currency, um, that's a threat to every government. Every government wants a monopoly in their own currency. And particularly if you get a better currency, uh, because it doesn't get devalued. Um, they, in history, they've outlawed gold and they've outlawed silver and so on, and they could outlaw Bitcoin. And, um, and the digital currencies make it more uh, traceable in many ways. If, if you have a gold coin, um, it's not like it's traceable. It's not connected to um, it's the digital network. And that also has to do with... Um, you, you know, um, hacking and so on. I, I think you could easily find, um, you're seeing much more malware. You see much more ransomware. In other words, breaking in and then um, looking for a payment quite often, that's in Bitcoin. Um, but you're, um, that digital component is, by the way, a risk for our society and could be a risk for uh, operating that way. So um, uh, and then uh, I'm a uh, Mr. Diversification. Um, you know, one of the great things about a stock index is that um, every company um, practically has gone broke. Uh, uh, you know, you go the Dow 30 and you see where they were not many years ago and, and you watch them and every company dies. But the stock market doesn't die because it rebalances to the, the new that comes in uh, to replace the old. And I respect that particular process. So when I think about that, I think um, um, I, I'm, I'm not uh, a person who likes all of their eggs in one basket. So I have um, some element of diversification that represents a small percentage of my total, let's call it inflation hedge asset class um, or reflation hedge asset class. Um, and uh, that represents uh, that. And that's the way I think about it. And I could say a few more things. I would say uh, gold um, uh, right now, the, because the supply of Bitcoin is known and limited, uh, we can look at its comparison. And uh, Bitcoin now is worth about uh, $1 trillion. Um, and the total crypto is worth, um, uh, cryptocurrencies are worth about two and a quarter trillion dollars, roughly. Um, but let's take Bitcoin, um, whereas uh, gold that is not held by central banks and not used for jewelry is worth about uh, 20, uh, excuse me, 5 trillion. 
so that 20% of that is um, is is uh, Bitcoin, let's say, versus um, uh, the other uh, gold. And so when I look at that, um, I keep that in mind because I think over time, that which will be called, let's say, inflation hedge assets are probably likely to do better. That's why I'm not favorable to cash and those types of things, but also that, but the, it becomes a market share. Now that is what I've just given you is what I think about it, but it doesn't lend itself to sound bites. So, it, you know, people say, um, uh, what do you think about that? Do you love it or hate it? And it's just more complicated than that. I, I remember asking Bill Miller, who is somewhat of a zealot about, about Bitcoin, who, who's made an enormous fortune on it because he started buying it around $200 a coin. What, what would be a sensible, uh, a sensible allocation for, for a, a civilian like me, a, a layman like me? And he said, one to 2% of your portfolio. He said, then if it goes to hell, you'll be okay. And if it does really well, as I believe it will over the next 10 years, then you'll be glad that you owned it. Does, does that seem like a like reasonably in the ballpark or do you think that's excessive? No, I think that's right. Okay, thank you. Um, let, let's go back to China a little bit because when we were talking earlier on about the three great forces that, that were coming to make life difficult for the US, one that we didn't go into in, in great detail, it's obviously critically important, is the rise of China. And you mentioned in the book that uh, the, the, you, dis, you described the, the, the China as a strong power in rapid ascent, whereas the U.S. I think you you uh, describe as the the number one power, but in gradual decline. Can you obviously you've spent an enormous amount of time in China over the years? I think you first started traveling there in 1984 and have been there dozens of times. I remember your son Matt at one point went to live there with a a friend of yours who was very high up in the uh, financial world there. In, in the government. So you you understand China to an unusual degree. You don't have the sort of the the knee-jerk um, prejudice against China that a lot of outsiders who don't know much about it have. Can you give us a sense of why China is in this extremely formidable position, rising so rapidly, and, and also a sense of um, why that's such an extreme threat to the U.S.? excuse me, to the U.S.? Well, um, I mean, there are two dimensions to its rise, um, its size and its um, effectiveness in raising productivity and living standards. So China's four, a bit over four times the size of the United States. So that means if it had a per capita income that was half the United States, it would be twice the size of the United States. Um, um, and if you look back throughout history, um, I'm, I'm in the book, I show charts um, going back, you know, 1400 years, China has almost always been um, number one or number two in terms of its power. Of course, the world was much more separated then, but it um, was uh, much quicker to invent the printing press and many technologies and so on, um, and had um, more power in many ways. And so it's a culture um, that is an old culture and they study history and they are effective and they and in the classic ways that are measured in the book, you know, the 18 measurements, education is important, civility is important, those kinds of things. Um, and so uh, what I've seen when I started to go there, I started to go in, as you say, in 1984. And when I first started going, um, I would, um, there were, there was the closed door policy up until a Deng Xiaoping came to power in 1978 and they were just opening. And so the first company um, that was the only window company, they called it a window company because it was the only company that was out, allowed to look out and deal with the outside world was a company by the name of Citic. And they invited me to teach them about the world financial market. So when I went there, it was all bicycles and it was very poor. And I brought uh, calculators, $10 calculators, and, and I gave them to leaders and they thought they were miracle devices. Mm. And since then, per capita income, real income has increased by 26 times. And uh, their technologies, um, where they are in terms of quantum computing, AI, 
um, and almost any of them um, are um, rivaling the United States. Um, and so I saw that development. And I saw that basically, for the most part, they put together a bunch of um, right ingredients, including uh, tapping entrepreneurship and, um, and, and creating capital markets. Using capital markets, capitalism in a market economy, to be able to be successful. Because when I looked at um, all the other uh, empires, you look at the Dutch, the British, and so on, there was always the combination between the uh, ability of entrepreneurs to combine, uh, to get resources, to take the new ideas and make them grow, to um, build the wealth and so on. And um, so anyway, they, um, uh, they uh, integrated um, and changed radically, private companies and so on. And I've had the ability, because I've gone there so long and um, helped in many ways the, the, uh, some of the developments of the financial markets understanding over that period of time, to know very intimately um, how the leadership thinks about such things. Um, and um, the one thing that the Chinese is, are unique at is understanding the patterns of history themselves. Um, history is basically their religion. Mm -hmm. And they study history and they learn the lessons of history. And then they have what they call the dialectic, when things are at odds and, and the contradictions and how they then use that as a resolve. So something like capitalism and communism uh, together, how they try to make that move. And so you, um, I can see um, they're earning more than they're spending. They are making their education levels are higher. The um, I mean, not higher in, in the total sense. You'll see the statistics, but they'll put out maybe eight times as many computer engineers. They have um, free access to the data. They use data uh, very effectively. So they've um, become uh, quite remarkable in terms of technologies and so on. So they've gone from a, um, the evolution of countries it goes usually from uh, cheap things like you make textiles and so on, and then you and manufacture goods, you're the cheap place to produce, to going into um, cutting edge uh, inventiveness and technology. They made that evolution very effectively um, uh, because of the way that they're doing things. So I've seen that uh, up close and I've seen that then they've developed their capital markets and they, uh, you know, they welcome uh, foreign investment um, so that's what the picture looks like to me. What, what do you think the odds are that China will disappoint and will not actually live up to this promise, uh, this almost inevitable rise that, that you're predicting? A, a friend of mine the other day, um, who's a, a very uh, experienced professional investor, was saying he, he looks at things like the, the centralized government model, governance model, and thinks... Yeah, there are advantages, but tremendous disadvantages. There are productivity questions. He was saying, you look at things like the COVID vaccine in China, and he said, it, it was pretty ineffective. They did it quickly, but it was ineffective. And you look at their foray into semiconductors, and it, it, it didn't work out that well. And, and he also said something kind of politically incorrect to me, where he, he, he just said, well, who wants to move to China? And I, I asked this as someone who used to live in Hong Kong very happily. But do, do you, when you... I know that you stress test all of your all of your predictions and and forecasts and uh, of these many tr many trends. When you think about the the risk of disappointment, what what are you factoring in that you're thinking? Yeah, maybe China won't live up to this promise. Well, um, first of all, um, 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 I, the ingredients I look at in measuring the health gauge. Um, are the ones that I'm um, focusing in on because they reflect elements of health. And uh, those are the things, so that long list. Um, that just assigns probabilities of it. And the probabilities um, uh, having to do with things like capital formation and education, um, uh, the financial position, the debt is in its own currency, um, uh, those, uh, um, the, um, the number of uh, patents, inventions, um, those kinds of uh, health measures 
are the ones that I look at across all countries um, to produce that. And I think that there are different ways of producing that. I think one has to be very careful to be um, um, prejudiced against, um, let's say, uh, a, a more authoritarian re regime in terms of um, that kind of behavior, because that certainly existed. And the, uh, I think it is by and large correct that everything has pros and cons to it, and they're at odds. And when you try to balance things, you try to get the most of both. And they're trying to get the most and have demonstrated a very good ability to get to create freedom and capital resources and capital markets to tap entrepreneurship and have that market economy and so on that that shift at the same time as that's happening in a um, um, an autocratic type of more much more autocratic type of uh, system. And I look at that and I also say um, that there um, other other countries have the other side of their risks too. So um, in other words, the great risk of democracy has always been disorder, uh, anarchy. Um, and so when you look at the risk gauges, when I go down the risk gauges and I looked at, I think they're described very, very well in, in those measures. So um, uh, democracy and freedom is a terrific attribute. And the United States has um, really uniqueness in many ways of being able to um, draw from the rest of the world, should be drawing from the rest of the world, the smartest and the brightest, because one of the great things about the United States is it's the only country in the world that you can go to and you can be a citizen, a part of it, and not an outsider. There aren't any countries in the world that's like that. So you can attract the best and the brightest to do the most innovative types of things. And when you have rule of law and you have property rights protections and you have all of those things, those are important competitive advantages if fully tapped to make a very, very productive system. I believe in those, type, those types of things. Um, and at the same time, I think that we're threatened by some of these other things, which have to do with the level of indebtedness, the way we're at each other's throats, and the actual threat to democracy. Um, I cover that you know, in the book, and, and you look at where we are. January 6th uh, incident is not, it's, it's just a straw in the wind. It is a likelihood, there's a reasonable likelihood that law and the Constitution will not be the governing uh, way of operating because people are more inclined to fight for their results to get what they want than to even uh, defer, you know, um, to, to look to the greater good and to have compromises. So each place has pros and cons. And that's why in the book, I tried to show each one of those pros and cons and to uh, weigh those types of things. What, one of my takeaways from the book in practical terms was just thinking, okay, so so if Ray is right about these long-term trends, which I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident that you are, even though obviously these are probabilistic, that's not certainties. If you're right, what are, what are the long-term trends that I want to play? How do I position myself so that I'm, I'm making sure that I'm aligned with these big cycles so that I'm playing, for example, the rise of China, but also the 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 less impressive, but still very impressive rise of India. Uh, and also, I guess, simultaneously, the decline of the US, uh, the dwindling importance of, um, of uh, Great Britain, which clearly is the most important country in the world, but uh, uh, sad, sadly seems to be on a downturn, uh, uh, France, Japan. How, how do regular investors position themselves so that they, obviously, we know that this should be part of a diversified portfolio, but is it is it that you just want to tuck away a low fee emerging markets index fund or ETF? Is it that gives you exposure to places like China and India and Taiwan and Korea and the like? Or is, is there another smarter way that you would do it as a regular investor who doesn't have the kind of sophistication that your team has? Well, you're asking about investment, and I'll just to, to point out, it's also broader than investment. It has to do with like, where do you wanna live? 
and 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 so on in that kind of an environment. Uh, you, you know, um, you're seeing uh, within the United States people move from one state to another, and you're seeing that because we um, are a federal government, we have state rights. That there are different approaches to life, uh, different regulations, and so on. And you see that people like to be with the, uh, themselves, and particularly, let's say, rich people like to go to places where they're among rich people and they're not, um, uh, you know, threatened, not just in terms of money and so on. And people are moving and you see hollowing out of certain areas. Uh, when they leave, um, then they take the tax base with them and it causes conflict in, in different areas. So well, I think what, in answering your question, I think it's very important to think about, um, you know, let's say all of the things in terms of um, that, um, um, those risks. That's why in the book I cover all of those types of things, many others too. But um, in the development of uh, the portfolio, um, again, um, the way I think about it is um, there's a certain portfolio that I view as kind of like my safe portfolio. Um, uh, you know, almost it's better to think about two portfolios than sort of one. People tend to think, what is the best portfolio? But there's a portfolio um, of assets that are better to have almost like if you have a worst case scenario and to have enough in those uh, assets that are worst case scenario. Um, and, you know, that could be um, uh, maybe it's gold, maybe it's a Bitcoin, maybe it's uh, some inflation index bonds. Maybe it's, um, I don't know, some other assets overseas and, and different things. Um, and then you, then you go above that. And, but still, diversification is the most important thing. I think that uh, when I started, um, you know, uh, since the beginning, let's say, when I didn't have any money, I would think, uh, what is the, uh, how many months can I live to take care of me and my family if no income came in. And then I, um, and I wanted that to be in years. And I wanted that, and then I figured, well, I mean, I, maybe that goes down in half between taxes and inflation, maybe, or, or losing money. So I want to take that number and I want to double it, whatever that is. And then to get that amount of money and to then be secure and to know that that's going to happen is uh, in that way is a very, very good thing. And then when you go from that level, then you go beyond that level to be able to build a better diversified portfolio. To me, they always have to be diversified. And the reason I say diversified also is all assets compete with each other. So um, it's not like one asset is better than the other asset. Uh, it's like horses in a horse race. Um, they get handicapped. Um, it, you're as likely if you bet on the worst company, um, worst companies, you might make more money than on betting on the best companies uh, because it's discounted in the price. And so because of the fact that there's this equalization of uh, by this discounting mechanism, it's kind of tough to say which is the best. And that also leads it to have to favor diversification over that. I mean, I think about that well. But those are the thoughts that I think as an individual navigating those. And I would say, you know, like um, um, that I've seen many countries of normalcy uh, become abnormal and difficult places. Or, and you could see that even in, in perhaps certain states that it could be, you know, difficult. Uh, so anyway, I like to have that kind of diversification. Yeah, th th this to me was one of the most powerful messages of the book. There was a there was a wonderful point I think where you mentioned imagining yourself in 1900 and looking at the ten most powerful countries of the time and saying, "Well, actually, if I figure out how we would have done since then, I would have been totally wiped out in seven of those countries at some point." And and so it seems to me there's just a very strong one of the strongest practical conclusions from your book is actually. Uh, to, to go back to a Chinese adage that you quote, a, a smart rabbit has three burrows, that you should always be be assuming, well, yeah, maybe this is a good time, maybe I feel rich, but actually, I need to be aware that it it may be a lot more precarious than I think, and that 
as, as you say at one point, the most important thing both in investing and life is, is not to get knocked out of the game. That's it. So, so if we could turn a little bit to um, how you think, we've talked a bit about how you, how you invest, but obviously one of the most interesting things about the, the intellectual experiment that is, is Bridgewater is that it's, it's, it's really a kind of so social engineering experiment in how to think better. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about what, what we can learn from things like this idea of radical truthfulness or your commitment to radical transparency. Can, can you explain how, how an idea of meritocracy works and why, why this concept is something that be, beyond these immediate questions about what to do in this environment, why this is actually a way that we need to learn how to think because it's very helpful? Well, um, what, <clears throat> what I believed in and found um, the, the basis of whatever success I've had or we've had um, is um, in one long sentence, um, an idea meritocracy in which the goals are meaningful work and meaningful relationships through radical truthfulness and radical transparency. So what I mean by that is I want the best ideas to win out without a hierarchy standing in that way. How do I find the best ideas to win out? And that's an idea meritocracy. And um, when I say the goals of meaningful work and meaningful relationships, <clears throat> the best success in, the mo in life, not just be measured in finances, but measured in the richness of one's life, is in meaningful work and meaningful relationships. If people are devoted to a mission to be great, and at the same time have these relationships, and in order to have those relationships be most effective, they have to be re radically truthful with each other and radically transparent. But ra let's take radically truthful. We have to get at what's true. And, and if you don't get at what's true, you won't know what to do about it. And the fact that if you're not radically truthful with each other, you won't get at that. You won't talk about problems or weaknesses Everybody has weaknesses. Everybody makes mistakes. And the capacity to um, look at those and understand one's weaknesses. Uh, for example, I, um, knowing what people will like led me to make a, um, a test. There's, there's, it, it's online, it's free. It's called Principles You. I put it online. And you could look about what you're like, how you think, and you could look at how other people think and we think differently, we're programmed differently, our brains work differently. To know that and make that our strengths and weaknesses and to allow us to play, know what positions we should play and to know how to deal with each other is a great benefit. And truthfulness over a period of time builds trust. If uh, now It may be painful at times to talk about that, but you can get past that pain because you have trust. And these relationships part, I also, uh, you know, referred to it as tough love. Tough love is the best kind of love. Um, tough love is very difficult to give um, uh, uh, because people might not like it. But when they get used to it, that you care about people, that you genuinely care about people. I, I genuinely cared about these people. They were extended part of my life. I, if they were sick, uh, seriously, um, I couldn't just have an insurance policy take care of them. I would introduce them to my doctor, and then I made an arrangement with my doctor so they wouldn't be the doctor, but they'd make sure they're getting good medical attention. Where I had, um, you know, a uh, house in Vermont, I'd, let, I'd, I'd love them to stay there. Um, we were at each other's um, big events, um, you know, b birthday, um, weddings, uh, baby showers and those kinds of things. Not it was optional. No, no need to do that things. But when there's also love and tough, they go together and they can reinforce. It's easier to when you care about somebody and you're tough with them. That kind of works. And then they're um, um, into the mission, and they're not working for a few bucks more because when you have people who um, um, will. Uh, trade who they're with and what their mission are, is on for a few bucks more. They're living a shallow life, and they're and you're not you're losing that kind of devotion. 
And so that's why the, ra- the truthfulness, the radical truthfulness works. And then transparency, so that everybody could see everything. I mean, literally, almost ev- everything, that, except if it's proprietary or extremely personal, would be uh, recorded so anybody could see. They could see us struggle with difficult questions. And they could understand those things because transparency is a key ingredient to understanding because everybody gets spin from everybody else. If they, you know, what happened, then you hear somebody's description, which is bias. And so that process uh, really uh, worked great. My, my sense from people who know you well, and we, we've talked before, and I, my sense from other people is you're, you're a good guy. You're someone who cares deeply about your family and friends and, and colleagues. And 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 yet there's a part of me that wonders about how you deal with this conflict between the desire to be a good friend, a good father, a good husband, a good grandfather, a good colleague, and, and the, the, the downside of hurting people emotionally in a system that emphasizes truthfulness and, and candor. And I, I'm sure there have been times where that's actually been a, a, a kind of painful for you as a sensitive person. And I'm wondering if you could just talk to that, because I, I do I do worry about I, I can see the intellectual benefit of your experiment. I can see the money-making experiment. But but I also, if I'm honest about it, I do think there's a risk of a loss of humanity and kindness and compassion. And I, I just wanted to to see what, what nuance you could add to I don't think that. so. I think it's just something like um, if you tell, if people have a bias against um, their maybe it's their weakness or their mistakes. And if that becomes painful, you're not helping them. It's like if somebody has something going wrong and you tell them, what is a good friend? Um, And when you look at um, many of things in life, I would call it the, the great trick of life that first order consequences are often the opposite of second order consequences and the second order consequences are more important. For example, you know, um, tasty food is more likely to be bad for you than uh, less tasty food or exercise, which is painful, is more likely to be good for you than not exercise and so on. Um, financial discipline is likely to be good for you um, rather than um, lack of financial discipline. It's almost like the second order consequences. And if you can get people to start to realize, like, I really care about you. That's why I'm trying to deal with these things. And I don't know what's true. We together have to find out what's true. So if you're disagreeing with me about uh, my strengths or your strengths done in a non-hierarchical way, because we all have strengths and weaknesses, if we can do that and then set out as our mission to find out what's true. So how do we do a test to find out, is that your strength or that's improvement? Because improvement for you, your own personal development comes really from recognizing that you don't have all the answers or that you could be biased about your opinions or your, even yourself and what your strengths are. And once you can get past that, you can be very, very effective because everybody has, uh, there are pros and cons. Nature did not invent away anything that doesn't have a purpose. And there are all these different ways of thinking. They all have purposes. And so you have, if you have a big picture thinker and you have a detail thinker, um, they can frustrate each other. But if they can work well together, that's the magic. And so that knowing those things is produces outcome. So intellectually, it's quite like exercising or eating well. Um, at first, it seems difficult to do this, but then you won't be able to do it any other way because you start to experience the rewards. So you find that people at Bridgewater would have a problem being anywhere else because almost those other places seem disingenuous and you don't know what's really going on. They seem very political where it's very straightforward and you appreciate the honesty. So that's what the cycle is like. It it seems to me another very striking aspect of why you've succeeded as a a thinker and, and how you've managed to set up an organization that thinks in a superior, more rational way is also this habit that you have of, as, as you put it, failing well, 
of, of learning from your mistakes. And I, I remember you've talked in the past about um, this trial by far that you had, I think, in 1982, where you made a mistake that, that could have broken you and that set you on a different path to, I think, welcome, in a sense, um, the understanding that maybe you were wrong and maybe you needed to stress test your opinions. Can you talk about the the the, the evolution that came about because you made that mistake and how how critical a role that's played in setting you on this path of of learning from mistakes, being radically truthful, trying to trying to solicit thoughtful disagreement. Um, sure, I'll, I'll I'll tell the story. Um, so I formed uh, Bridgewater in 1975 out of my you know it's two bedroom apartment. I built this little company, um, and then in um, the 19 19- 79, 80, 81 period, um, that was extraordinarily high real interest rates, lots of debt, and so on. I calculated that American banks had lent more money to foreign countries than those countries were going to be able to pay back. And I had a very controversial point of view that we were going to have this big debt crisis. Um, And then on August 1982, Mexico defaulted on its debt and a number of other countries followed. And because I anticipated the debt crisis, I got a lot of attention. And and then I thought we were going to have this collapse because of the debt crisis. It was one of those experiences that I hadn't been through before in that way. And I couldn't have been more wrong. August 1982, when Mexico defaulted, was the exact bottom of the stock market. The Dow at 777, the Dow bottom. And I couldn't have been more wrong. And I was wrong for me and I was wrong for my um, uh, clients. And um, 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 that was very painful experience, not only because of the losing of money, but I uh, was so broke, I had to borrow $4,000 from my dad. And, um, you know, because I had a family and and I was in that position and I had to let everybody go, really. And I was down to me and thinking, okay, am I going to, you know, put on a tie and um, get on the railroad and go into Wall Street, or uh, you know, how is that going to work, and all of that. That painful experience was one of the best pain, best experiences in my life. It's transformative um, because it it gave me the humility that I needed to balance with my audacity. In other words, it gave me a fear of being wrong without me losing my audacity, because I then knew. Um, so I wanted to find the smartest people I could find who disagreed with me to stress test their thinking. And I really wanted to understand how to diversify in a way which didn't lose my upside, but gave me my downside. So at that point, um, and, and I really do think painful experiences are the learning. Uh, my son afterwards gave me a book uh, by Joseph Campbell called Hero of a Thousand Faces. And they describe that um, there's these uh, in almost all lives a lot, unless you have, you know, uh, you don't take much risk or anything, but risk equals return, um, that there's um, an abyss, that you have the time in your life where something really terrible happens and you go down. And um, and, and I have a, an expression, pain plus reflection equals progress. Because the painful experiences and that that Joseph Campbell example that he had in the book is that you have a metamorphosis, you change, and that metamorphosis helps to uh, make you better. And so from that experience, that was the bottom for me, and that was the bottom for Bridgewater. And every year since then, we you know we kept getting better and better, and, and it kept going up. So that's that was what my experience was like in a teacher. Um, because also risk goes with opportunity. And so I've sort of felt um, like um, I can have a safe life um, by not taking risk. And it was like, I'm on one side of a jungle and uh, can do, or do I want to go through this dangerous jungle with all sorts of things that can kill me and, um, and, and that to get to the other side and have a great life. And so that's a lot like life because you can take risk and and you can, um, but, and it provides opportunity. Then I said, how do I go through that jungle to be effective? How do I get the returns without the same amount of risk? That was the puzzle that I had to solve. And then I realized I didn't want to have um, less than a great life. So I, I have to go through the jungle, but I realized 
that going through the jungle with people who are on the same mission to make it through the jungle, who could also see things differently so that they could pick that they could see what I couldn't see and so on, and that we would help ourselves through that jungle. And so it struck me like um, um, mistakes were um, like um, puzzles that I would have to solve in order to be to get a gem. It was like uh, like that. Uh, OK, a mistake. Gee, what does that tell me about how reality works and how I'm going to deal with reality to be effective? Because it's a reflection of reality in my dealing with reality. And so that was a puzzle. And then if that puzzle would give me a gem, if I could answer that puzzle, and the gem then was a principle that I could carry forward to be better in the future. So that was what the whole experience and the journey was like. And these that's why I believe the things I believe. I, I, I'm struck by the fact that multiple times, both in the in this book and in principles and uh, and in other writings of yours, you've talked about welcoming being corrected. I, I remember a recent piece I think you wrote about Bitcoin where you said, I, I, I'm happy to be co corrected. And it strikes me that that's an extraordinary strength in terms of your But isn't it, isn't it so stupid that anybody wouldn't want to be corrected? I mean, like, that so exemplifies the problem, right? Everybody's attached to being right. And so, it like, I don't care where being right comes from. I just want to, you know, I want to be right. And if it comes from other people and I learn, isn't it an extraordinary thing that in our society that that's considered unusual? Isn't it stupid? Yeah, but there's clearly, you you mentioned, I think, in principles that, that, being corrected often triggers people's fight or flight response, that it's just painful to them. And I was wondering, in, I've, I've spent a lot of time over the last 25 years interviewing legendary investors, and they all strike me as having very unusual personalities. And I, I, I know you've done a lot of psychometric testing. And I'm wondering, when you look at the kind of testing you've gone through, is there something about your particular personality that you look at and you think, well, yeah, I'm a very independent thinker. I'm happy to, I'm not emotional about these things. Are there, are there aspects of your personality that you think predisposed you to be a successful investor because you would say more rational or less emotional? Um, um, no, I think that it comes down to um, uh, neuroscience and habit, um, that there are two parts of our brain that there's the thoughtful part of the brain that's analytical and conscious. And then there's the subliminal part of the brain that it, subliminal meaning is, and it's unconscious and it's working there and it's doing its own set of calculations, some of which are emotional and so on. And that, that, um, uh, and that they could often be at odds. I'm an emotional person. I think the best things are um, love, inspiration, excitement, and all of those types of things. Um, so it doesn't mean being unemotional. But what I think that a couple of things affected me. So I think, and almost anybody can affect, be affected. Um, one of the things is in order to succeed in the game I play, I have to go through the dynamic that I'm describing. So that affected me. Accuracy is the thing that I treasure. Accuracy is truth. I treasure that. Um, it's a foundation of those good things. Also, uh, meditation. I've meditated. I learned to meditate um, when I was about 19. And, um, I, um, and what that does, it's a process of basically um, relaxing and living, and then you go into your subconscious mind. And I think that that's helped to give me the equanimity that I need. And also creativity comes from the subconscious mind. If you can align your subconscious mind with your conscious mind so that they, they're aligned and they sort of filter each other, because anything that's just coming up out of the subconscious, maybe it's going to do you harm and maybe it's the intuition and the creativity that's going to help you a lot. And then there's the conscious mind um, and it doesn't have the same amount of those kinds of things, intuition and so on. But it also could be junk that's coming up and you're emotional and you get carried away and you make the bad decisions. When you can align them, I think that that's advantageous. So I would say meditation played a role. Um, and then uh, what I need to do, which is I need to be right. I don't care where being right comes from. I need to be right. And if it comes from somebody else 
or it comes from wherever it comes from, that's going to be uh, helpful to me. So I think that those experiences, I think that our education system and the reinforcement of this terrible ridiculousness in which um, um, people are attached to being right. Okay, I came up to it, that ego barrier or that bl or there, and there's blind spot barrier because we think differently. We can process things. Some people could see the big picture. Some people could see the details. They need each other, but their, their brains work differently. So um, that's why, um, you know, the, that's why I do these personality profile tests, which again, I'll say principles you, everybody goes on it. It's free, 30 minutes. It'll tell you a lot about yourself. You could put your um, somebody else on it too, and it'll tell you a lot about your relationship. But I think that knowing those things is, uh, you know, a, a real benefit. It's really developmental because I saw that I could change how people were. Not everybody, couldn't change how everybody was. But over a period of time, like exercise, it started to be clear that there were rewards from being this way. And then once people started to experience those rewards, then they started to really want to be that way. And so they can change. People can change to be that way. It starts off intellectually realizing how silly it is to be the other way. And then saying, you're really in a war with yourself, uh, your conscious mind and your subconscious mind, then thinking, oh, okay, what, uh, you know, how do I resolve that? Do I want to know the truth? Let's say, for example, if I was thinking that uh, you were doing badly or weak, or weak at something, or you were thinking badly, I mean, start off with the question, uh, would you like me to tell you or would you not like me to tell you? And the logical mind will tell you, um, uh, yes, I'd like you to tell me, at least I know what you're thinking. And maybe, who knows, maybe you're right. The emotional part of your brain would say, I don't want to, and I might get angry. I think somewhat fearfully, I would, I would definitely want you to point out what I'm screwing up and how to think better and how to operate better. But, it, but I would do it with, with, uh, with trepidation. And what you'll experience if you do that, if we both did that together, so it's out of caring and that we try to say, we don't know. And how do we find out, okay, maybe you have that strength and weaknesses uh, and maybe you don't. That's why I say both parties have got to get to the point where they agree. But then we might say, how do we do a test? How do we find out? And then by doing those tests and be, wanting to be on the mission together to find out what your strengths and weaknesses are, then people find it, you're 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 realizing it's the love of the tough love, and then it's also um, one of those things that derives benefit, and then you like it. I, I wanted to go back a, a bit to this question of meditation, which I think is hugely important. I'm I'm a pretty devout believer in meditation, and and I think partly because my mind is all over the place as a writer, and I'm uh, I'm uh, I, you know, I come from a long line of uh, Jewish refugee immigrants. And so I think we probably inherited a bunch of fear and anxiety and uh, that, that I think it helps me tame in some way. And, and I was just wondering how it's helped you in terms of resilience, in terms of the ability to, to sit kind of calmly within the storm, because I, I, I don't know if it's a coincidence, but I think you started meditating in, when you were about 19, which I think was also around the time that your mom had died. And I know that that was pretty traumatic, and she had died in your in your arms, having had a heart attack. And I'm wondering how how you found meditation helpful in terms of giving you the kind of not not just the clarity of thought, but actually the emotional resilience to deal with the the, the problems and suffering that all of us, at sooner or later, come come up against in life. Well, I discovered meditation uh, by uh, transcendental meditation when the Beatles did it. They came back and I figured I'd give it a try. And um, I think almost anybody who tries it and sticks with it past the impatience of it um, realizes that they don't want to do without it. You know, it's just a matter of time. Um, and so what happens, I'll describe it to your audience. Um, there's um, what's called a mantra, which is a sound uh, that you repeat in your head. Uh, maybe an example would be OM. And when you're thinking about, when you close your eyes and you're relaxed and you're thinking in your mind over and over again, 
Om, it takes your mind away from your thoughts, which you find all jumping around. And so you find it a little bit difficult because you repeat Om and then you want to go back to your thoughts and so on. And the thing to know about that is if you can't clear your mind of those thoughts, uh, you need to meditate. So don't get impatient, stay, stay there, do the practice. And then when you do that and you stay within that sound Om, then it disappears. And then you go into a transcendent kind of state, which means you're very uh, quiet. It's not like being conscious or unconscious. Uh, like in, in uh, um, it's not like sleeping because if you were here like a, a noise, you know, a ding like that or something, it, it's it's startling and so on. But you're then in that you're going really into your subconscious, and in your subconscious, then um, yeah, and you're um, it, it doesn't mean that you're aware of your subconscious, but you start to um, experience equanimity. Um, and I think you and you experience um, uh, equanimity, you, um, in other words, that calmness in the storm, um, you align your intellectual with your emotional, it brings out creativity, because creativity a lot comes from the subconscious. It's like if you take a hot shower, and th these ideas come to you. In fact, when I meditate, it's, it's one of the problems is as I go down to meditate, I get these great ideas and, and I have to almost put them aside in order to continue the meditation. Um, and so that is what the process um, is like. And then um, it gives you a, a sort of a sense of almost going above things and looking down at things objectively. Um, I, I think that there's an element of spirituality to it because um, um, it, like prayer or meditation or whatever, it's that repeating that kind of sound. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, different people do it. Spe by spirituality, I don't mean uh, God spirituality. I mean a sense of um, you're part of, uh, you're connected. You know, you feel a little bit connected. And then I, and then I felt essentially that everything is just reality. And I'm just dealing with reality. And so they may not be the realities I want, um, but they are the realities. And so to look at how does reality work and how do I deal with it the best possible way? Yes, I've had, you know, um, a number of things which are uh, devastating and, um, and uh, you know, and devastating could be devastating. And um, those we all do. And uh, but to be able to uh, feel those things. I lost um, a, a son about a year ago. Um, and, um, and, and that was devastating. Uh, worst thing that ever happened. I'd rather lose everything around my life, rather lose everything that I have, everything than to have had that particular experience. Um, um, and then, but, and, as, and I felt it in many ways. Um, I, I felt it and my family felt it. And I love my wife, I love my family and seeing the pain that that produced. But the ability, in a sense, to do it in a very natural way and to go through it, I won't get into the twists and turns of what I did exactly, or what we did, but, um, and that's, it's just a reality. And I have to accept that reality because a lot of our unhappiness um, comes from forming these expectations of what should be, and then, and then feeling, you know, it was taken away those types of things. So it, it has affected the way I kind of look at those things. And I, I see myself within a life arc. You know, you see, you see things differently. Like I'm 72 years old. I know exactly where I am in my life arc. And that's the way reality works. And so all of those things, meditation has helped me gain those things. In, in, a, in a, thank you for sharing that. In, in, a, in a way, there seems to me a common denominator here between your um, commitment to radical truthfulness and radical transparency and the way that you've dealt with these losses, that it's, it's refusing to look away. It's, it's, it's being willing to abide with the pain, to look at reality as it is, not to, I think most of us, whether we're dealing with personal pain or dealing with our own flaws and failings, we try to look away because it's too painful. And it strikes me that one of your great strengths both as an investor and a thinker and, and in your personal life is that the, the, the courage actually 
to you know Marcus Aurelius said you have to you have to hold a paper bag and look at the rotting meat inside it, not look away. The it's a horrible image, but in a sense that that willingness to to confront reality as it is rather than as we wish it to be. Yeah, one of the principles that I learned uh, that's most important is pain plus reflection equals progress. Um, I, and um, pain tells you about how reality works and how to deal with it better. And so if you have the reflection, a lot of people experience pain and then also then the pain might go away and they never had the reflection that provided the learning. When you have the reflection that provides the learning, I think pain is the most effective teacher. You put your hand on a hot stove or something. It has a purpose. Uh, it, we don't like it. It's first order consequences are terrible. Um, but it, 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 it second order consequences, if used properly, provides learning and provides improvement. Has, has going through the, the unspeakable horror of losing your son, which I, I, I can only imagine as the father of a 23-year-old boy and a 20-year-old, has, how, how has that changed you? How has it taught you and made you think differently about your own mortality or what you want to do with the rest of your life or how, how you want to honor the, the memory of your son? Are there, are there ways in which that, that experience that we wouldn't wish on anyone has, the, reflecting on it has, has changed you? Um, yes, I'll uh, describe the experience. Um, um, uh, keeping him and wanting him to be part of our lives and at the same time being in the right experience. Um, so, uh, and, and, and dealing with it, not by turning away as uh, you say, but going to it and going to him and going. So my wife and I have uh, tea every morning. And so we sit on a couch and we have the tea. And so putting a picture of him in front of us and then going into the experience of um, journaling, we, we, this helped us. We, um, we want to journal memories of him. And that brought up the emotions and the memories. We wanted to go into it and, and we went into it. Um, and then we um, had a book that was a wonderful book about how to, um, um, what it's like and so on. And so, um, and that we did it in our, whatever way was natural to be able to keep him there um, with us. So that, that how, do you, how do you have him gone and also not gone? And through that process, what is his role? Start to think about his daughter. He had a three-year-old daughter. How, to, how, to, how we can do that with her and so on. What the family means. And then of course, it uh, um, reminded me that um, that was, this happened in COVID. We, I was not alone in having all those deaths occur to other people were having loved ones that, that it's a, it, it was a common phenomenon as each person is going through that and, and to look at it in, in a sense in that way. Um, and also then, um, 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 then putting a reminding what, what's most important in life, you know, um, and making sure that that's taken care of. Um, you know, others, um, others um, that I love and, and take care of and cherish that moment, not losing it, um, because it's a reminder of the realities. Um, and it's a good reminder of um, I've, I've, I've uh, had cases where I thought um, in one case, I, I, my wife or loved ones might might die for some some things. And I think it's and, and then you find out, um, OK, they're OK. And then uh, it reminds me that one day that'll happen. And um, what a gift. And so it helps to savor life more and um, make a point of that and also make, uh, you know, the life more purposeful. Uh, those are the things that, um, you know, uh, that experience gave me. Are there any philosophical or spiritual books or traditions, whether it's Buddhism or Stoicism or Christianity that, that have helped you that you would recommend for other people not in a in a proselytizing way obviously but i remember hearing 
you you got tremendous comfort from the serenity prayer, for example. Can, is, there... Well, I view that as uh, um, um, the the Dalai Lama uh, once told me that he he said I, I met him. I find I, I don't have a particular answer to your question. I don't have a particular religion or teaching um, that I follow. Um, I'm curious, and I love to speak to people of all different beliefs and, and see what their thoughts are. And there's a lot of wisdom. Um, and so uh, once I had a conversation with the Dalai Lama, and he described as religion as the as basically the combinations often of the mixture of uh, spirituality um, and superstition. Um, I'm uh, I, I tend um, to um, you know uh, say I, I I know what I you know I I think what I know and then there's a lot that I don't know but I know that the universe works as the way the universe works and I get some sense of how that all works and so there's sort of wisdom and so I don't look at the serenity prayer as uh, a prayer in a religious sense. I look at it as um, what, what is a very good, appropriate approach to life. God, give me the serenity to accept the things I can't control and give me the power to control those that I can and give me the wisdom to tell the difference. And I've said that to many people who are not religious, that maybe the word prayer is misleading, but I think that that's right. You know, in other words, um, there are things you can't control. And um, and that means that you have to have you have acceptance of those types of things. And that's just reality interacting with you. And that's just the way it is. And you have to accept it. You may not like it, but you have to accept it because um, you can't change it. And then you move beyond. And how do you learn those lessons? So that's the control, the things you can control, learn the lessons. That's the best way to do it. So I believe in that, but not as a prayer but more as a, a good piece of advice. Yeah. When, when, you, when you look at the, uh, the, the future and you think about how you want to be remembered, what you want your legacy to be, obviously you, you've had an extraordinary amount of success. I mean, you, on, in purely um, financial terms, I mean, you, you, know, you have said by Forbes to have $20 billion and, and you, know, you have a couple of thousand people, I think, working for you. You have an incredible ability actually to shift the dial in the in the world and actually make a difference and i know that you're you, you've been very philanthropic over the years i i wondered if you could give a sense of um when you think about what you want to do with the rest of your life which i hope will be long and long and fruitful what what how do you how do you think about that question um I think that there, um, there's this life arc, and uh, what do you, you know, we each have our purposes in life um, um, and our preferences. Um, um, uh, for me, I think everything's around evolution, involving personal, evolving pers uh, personally, and then also contributing to evolution. Um, and then, uh, but I, uh, and, but I have my preferences and I know where I am in my arc. And, um, so I love my family. I love my friends. Um, and that experience is very important. I view it as life is just like, you know, a footprint of sand on the beach. It'll, um, um, it, it's not a matter of, uh, permanence and whatever I do will be modest in comparison to the things. The best thing I can do is pass along those things that I'm leaving of value um, and those um, and have the enjoyment of that. Uh, passing along those things of value, I think most importantly, are my uh, principles that have served me well, um, because, you know, better to teach a man how to fish than to um, give them a fish. And so um, that's why I put out um, these books, pass them along for people to take or leave. I don't know if they're right or wrong, but people could look at them and decide, you know, what they are, because I think that's most valuable. Um, and then, of course, um, I've been blessed by this um, wonderful land of opportunity and so on. I didn't make a lot of money really because I intended to. It's just the game that I played is very rewarding that if, if you play it well, you, it's rewarding. And um, and then um, and then you uh, I realized 
that making money is is no goal. It's, it's sort of a stupid goal because money has no intrinsic value. Only can, what can you do with money? And that's the only thing that matters. And so when I think about that, I think, um, uh, okay, what do I want to do with that? And what makes, uh, what's contributory, contributing? And also um, um, uh, what makes me feel good? Um, and what the others do. So we do our philanthropic activities it's like a family that we try to uh, find a, each our own passions and we, and, and we do that um, because that really is oriented to what is the goal in life. Um, some people think the goal in life, as I say, is to make money, but, that, um, but instead, if no, no, if you have money, what do you wanna do with money? But money is one thing, uh, really the interaction. So for me, meaningful work and meaningful relationships, savoring life while I contribute um, in those ways is, is what I wanna do. And I'm, 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 I view myself, uh, as I say, 72, I'll probably put out one more book, which will be um, Economic and Investment Principles. Um, and then I'm gonna go quiet. Um, I, you know, there's no reason I will have passed along anything that um, in terms of ideas that I have. Um, and so that's kind of what I think about the future and what I'm trying to uh, do, pass along things. If I could ask you one final question, as I'm, I'm aware, aware that I've exhausted your generosity in, in giving us so much time here. Um, you, 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 you write a lot, actually, about evolution. There's a, there's a, there's a point, I think, uh, in the dedication, actually, where I think you say, may the force of evolution be with you in dedicating the book to, to your grandchildren. You, you, you talk at one point about how evolution is the biggest and only permanent force in the universe, yet we struggle to notice it. And in, in some ways, this book is kind of a scary book. It's talking about the ways in which the, the US can be um, on the brink of a really difficult period, the ways in which there can be lots of turmoil as the, as the greatest global power at the moment um, is unseated. So there's reason to read the book with some degree of fear, but there's also a great degree of trust that you seem to have in, in the power of evolution in this sort of general upward trajectory of the world. And I, I wondered if you, could, if, if you could square that for me, that kind of conflict between the somewhat pessimistic sense that there are gonna be these really tough times that are likely to come in the next 10 years uh, and your general sense of trust in in human innovativeness and the power of evolution. Well, you can you could see it in the charts in the book. You know, um, you could see these uh, these cycles, um, kind of uh, the ups and the downs, and they work. And I, I sort of track that cycle, and then you could see that that cycle for everything is coming around an evolutionary uptrend. And when you look at the charts, you can you, you can see the one in relationship to the other. And the greatest force of mankind, and well, even beyond mankind, but the greatest force of mankind is the power to adapt and, um, and uh, evolve to higher living standards. So when you look at um, things like per capita income over time, or you look at uh, life expectancies and other things that you measure, and you look at that over the time, those periods which are the worst periods, the depressions, the wars, and so on, um, they barely show up in that bigger chart, when, uh, but they, they have in these cycles. And so because I can plot all of those things and we could see them, we can decompose them and you could see actually how reality is working. And reality works, but like that learning and that adapting has raised our living standards by almost any measure and if you look at even how we deal with our problems, that's our greatest force, because if you look at, let's say, the development of uh, vaccines being so quick and the technologies and all of that, that is the most powerful force. And that, that's not a um, ideological belief. That's not a uh, philosophical or religious belief. That is just you can see it in the charts and, you, and, and, and the movement up. So that's what it looks like to me. I draw a circle in um, I, I draw this looping process in the beginning of the book, and that's how evolution looks to me. That evolution is is really uh, advances, and then the advances start to taper off, and then problems start to occur. 
And then as the problems start to occur, then you have to identify the problems and then you have to diagnose them to get at the root causes. And then you have to design a solution. And if you design a solution, then you have to implement that design. And if you do that, then you go on to better circumstances, just like we went through over the last couple of years. And so it's that, uh, that just the, the way it works. It's just mechanical that it works that way. And so, on, so when I say optimism or potential, we have that capacity um, and, and we have the capacity to invent. The main thing is we have to stop doing financially combination of financially responsible things and then also be well with each other. If I look around at countries, I mean, it's basically, I look at three things. Are they earning more than their savings? Are they are the people internally civil with each other, good with each other to be productive rather than self-destructive? And externally, are they uh, likely to have a war or are they likely to have a peace? And you could go back from you can grow across countries and you could see it. It surfaced in the um, it surfaced in the um, you know how people are reacting to uh, masks and things and, and so on. So you see these patterns. So there are these cycles, but the greatest force is that evolutionary force, man's inventiveness. And I think there's tremendous potential for that now, particularly because of of thinking. Um, uh, thinking means we're computerizing a lot of thinking. So our ability to work with a computer to help us thinking can produce better thoughts and we have enough resources. So that's where the great potential lies, I think. It's, it seems like also if we harness this in our own personal lives, the sense of evolution as a kind of master principle where you're saying, well, let me learn from my mistakes. Let me learn from people who are smarter than me, who disagree with me. They're, they're all of these, uh, let, let me learn from pain, from adversity. There are all of these ways in which you could actually apply this, this fundamental belief in, in evolution as a, as, a, as a core principle or force in life, actually to, to harness that very consciously in, your, in, in, in our own lives. Is that, is that fair to say? Absolutely. In the book, um, uh, first principle, the book I wrote first, Principles of Life of Work, um, I, I show this five-step process in which uh, there's advancement and then there's mistakes and then there's the learning from mistakes and diagnosing them and, their, and that process. And that is the process of evolution. And even ourselves, we look at ourselves as individuals, but we're largely vessels for our DNA. Nature made us as vessels for our DNA. Most species die at the point where they're not able to produce and so on. And so you see that evolutionary process as, uh, you know, there's, there's a major force and we can evolve faster and better if we embrace that and uh, deal with it, including learning from our mistakes and learning how reality works. Ray, thank you so much. You've been incredibly generous in explaining your, your thoughts, how you view the world. And I, I, I do think your books have been a tremendous contribution. They've had a, they've had a great impact on, on my own life and have helped me see much more clearly ver various things in the world. So uh, it, thank you so much for, for your generosity and talking with us. If, if, is, there, is there one final thought you'd like to leave us with before I let you go? No, not uh, just to say thank you for help, allowing me to help pass this stuff along. I hope it's of interest to people. And if it's of any good use, I'm happy that we did it. Thank you. Yes, it's, it's usually helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right, take care. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 